Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Is is Commissioner Hutchinson there? I don't really see everybody yes, in the diet. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so I guess we're going to try out modern technology. Is is um IT ready and Howard? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, Mr. Tipton, would you please join us in the invocation? I invite you to join with me if you're willing. Gracious Father, we remember this morning our recently retired county employee, Walt Franklin, who passed away less than one month after retiring from a career in road and bridge that spanned more than 32 years. We ask for your peace and grace on his family and friends during this difficult time. Father, we're reminded with Walt's passing that tomorrow is promised to no one and that time is as precious a gift as we can receive. May we always remember to make the most of each new day, to not put off till tomorrow what should be done now, and to embrace the possibilities and opportunities that each new day presents. To that end, Father, we ask for insight and understanding for our elected officials as they meet the challenges facing our community. And as always, may our words and our actions represent the best that is in each of us. Amen. 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 Please join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation. under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> we'll open it up to public comment. Is there anybody from the public wishing to come forward? Y'all will have to help me here because I don't see the podium. Is there anybody coming forward? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I signed up, so I don't know. But okay. All right. Shall I start? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioners and members present. I'm here today to thank the County Administrator, Howard Tipton, for bringing to you the ordinance requiring face masks covering the public places in the St. Lucie County. This mandatory face mask required a majority of three-fifths approval by the board. At this point, I thank those commissioners who voted for approval of this ordinance. For those that didn't, well, I'm here today to ask that you extend this ordinance and enforce it because just as recently as last Saturday, there was a, a walk across the bridge in Fort Pierce. My, my friend and I were going to participate. We went there with a mask. We parked. We walked across. I'm going to say about 60% of the people did not have their masks on. I am one of your vulnerable citizens. I can't take that risk, even though I want to go. We turned around, went back to our car, and left. Now, who was supposed to be there to enforce this wearing of the mask? Even though it was outdoors, we were, they were all clustered together, ha, 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 walking across the bridge. I want to participate in this government, in this country, and I support law enforcement. I couldn't do it because there's nobody here that said enforce that. There were parties at the Cove that nobody was there to enforce it. COVID-19 cases in St. Lucie County from 615, which is the date that Mr. Tipton had at your report, to yesterday, which is 64 days, there was an increase of 6,254 cases with the death toll of increase of 125 death, deaths during those days. That averages two per day for this county. I come from a country that you all probably never heard of, Thailand. It's the size of the state of Florida, maybe a little bit bigger. They have had, since the COVID, and next door to them is Vietnam, China, Burma, with COVID running around like crazy. They've had 64 deaths. 64 deaths with 3,000 cases, less than this county alone. 
And we're supposed to be the world leaders. So please, I know I only have 10 seconds. I just want to know that you are going to take responsibility for the enforcement of the face mask. Thank you so much. Ma'am, ma can we have you state your name for the record, please? Okay, thank you. Ingrid Van Hecken, 304 Anchor Way, St. Lucie Village, Florida, 34946. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Hi, my name, wait for the timer. Hi, my name is Mike, <clears throat> Michael Cabral. I live at 362 Southeast Walters Terrace. Trying to get in touch with world leaders and everybody in this world because, like I said last meeting, I said, I'd like to address the fact that we have babies out here making a fortune. I would much rather we get rid of poverty, things like extreme poverty and just poverty in general. Uh, anybody that wants to be part of society, we take care of them. You know, certain things like this is definitely putting a strain on the police department with the unfairness that somebody can just be handpicked, make millions of dollars before they, you know, even became an adult. They can afford to buy a house for cash. You know, they got to take out a loan and pay interest rates like oh, so many of our working class. This is ridiculous. So Trump, Putin, et cetera, come on, let's go. Let's get on the ball with this. You, you, you're killing our police, you're killing our military, you're making wars out of this city council has my phone number. So if this gets to you, I'm hoping it does, news media take off with this. Um, I'm not a threat, but there are people out there that are. I'm trying to keep them under wraps, under control, and make something better out of their future than them going nonsense and crazy. Uh, one of the ideas that we could do is rotate job position. We have to wait for somebody to retire or quit. Man, if people are ready, let's start testing people. Let's start making a... A, a, a chain where we can go ahead and, and says next level, next level, next level, not wait on, like if it's me, if I'm sitting on the boss spot, until I wanna retire. This is crazy, let's give a chance for everybody to move up, and if that means we all can't have a mansion yacht and a pool because we all made it and we just don't have that much in resources, let's share, let's talk about sharing things like that. We can take turns out on the yacht, you know, family, friends, gathering and stuff like that, but stay in this way. This is nuts. You know, you're, you're, you're all my family, all of you, Trump too included, you know, especially uh, religious people, we just Adam and Eve. We're all family. So let's start behaving like family. Stop acting nuts. Get this thing, you know, taken care of. Let's work on a new way, new ways, try out some different things, but try to find something better where somebody's not like, oh, it's luck of the draw. You know, little babies, you know, or a friend of a family. Hey, can you put my kid in the movie? Sure. Come on, this is ridiculous. All right, that's about it. Please get in touch with me. I want to hear from the world. If, if the world's not interested, I feel I've done my part, and I'll shut up <laughs> and get back to my life. But uh, county's got my number, so contact, please. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Seeing none. Is there anybody else coming forward? Madam Chair, seeing none. Okay, thank you. We'll close public comment. We'll come back to the approval of the minutes from June 26th, July 1st, and July 7th. Is there an approval for the minutes? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Madam Secretary, can you call the roll, please? Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We'll move on to proclamations. I'm going to ask Mr. Tipton at this time also if you'll please hand off the proclamation when we're finished. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. A resolution pro proclaiming September 2020 as Hunger Action Month in St. Lucie County, Florida. Whereas the Board of County Commissioners of St. Lucie County, Florida has made the following determinations. Hunger and poverty remain issues of grave concern in the United States. The state of Florida, the, tre the Treasure Coast, and St. Lucie County, with 40,770 children and adults in St. Lucie County now categorized as food insecure. St. Lucie County is committed to taking steps to raise awareness about the need to combat hunger in every part of our country and to provide additional resources that citizens of St. Lucie County need. St. Lucie County is committed to working with Treasure Coast, 
food bank in educating people about the role and importance of food banks and other hunger relief organizations in addressing hunger and bringing attention to the need to devote more resources and attention to hunger issues. Food banks and hunger relief organizations across the country, including Treasure Coast Food Bank, will coordinate Hunger Action Day on September 10, 2020, and will continue to host numerous events throughout the month of September to shed light on this important issue and encourage involvement in efforts to end hunger in their local community. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of County Commissioners of St. Lucie County, Florida. This board does hereby proclaim the month of September 2020 as Hunger Action Month in St. Lucie County, Florida, and call, the, and call this observance to the attention of our citizens. Passed and duly adopted this 18th day of August 2020. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve? Madam Chair, so moved. Second. Is there a second? Okay, thank you. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Is there anybody that would like to say anything at this time from the board? Seeing none, I just, I do want, I want to recognize the Treasure Coast Food Bank. They've done a lot through the COVID and um, we appreciate all that you've done along with Mustard Seed Ministries and Angels of Hope and everybody out there that's doing um, stuff for the hunger and the homeless. So thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Porter. With me today is Jackie Kenny. And um, just on behalf of the entire staff of Treasure Coast Food Bank, our executive directors, and of course our dedicated board of directors, uh, we'd just like to thank you, the commissioners, for your commitment in the fight against hunger here on the Treasure Coast. Um, we deal with about 100,000 individuals um, every day that are struggling with hunger. And so um, by proclaiming um, September as Hunger Action Month, um, it's really going to allow us to reach out to the community to, to gain their support, offer them opportunities to really get involved. Um, the entire month we'll be doing different things throughout the, um, <coughs> our website, through social media, through a lot of the virtual um, gatherings as well just to uh, make sure we can get as many folks involved as w in getting um, the word out about the issue of hunger. So, uh, of course, even un uh, during the unprecedented times with COVID, our staff are working around the clock uh, to provide much needed food and other essentials directed to our partner agencies, as well as conducting mobile food distributions. Uh, so again, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to proclaim September Hunger Action Month. And um, please visit our website at stophunger.org and you can find many ways that you can get involved with that. So again, thank you for um, making this happen today. Thank you. Is, is there a phone number that volunteers can call to organize to help you pack boxes and uh, shelf? Food Absolutely, 772-489-3034. Uh, Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we need to pause for a few seconds so Eric takes his picture? Uh, all done. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, there are no presentations. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Did everybody um, get their changes for the consent agenda? Yes. Is there anything that anybody would like to have pulled? Seeing none, is are there you, a motion? Are you gonna talk about the uh, project funded by the infrastructure sales tax? Um, I was gonna bring that up. You can go ahead about the Lakewood Park drainage. Go ahead. That's your baby. You've been working hard on that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, it's just, it's all good news. You know, we, we were able to get the grants and everything. And then the missing piece is from the sales tax. So because of everybody's forward thinking and voting that in, we will now have that project funded at 100%. So thank you, everybody. And thank you to Don West and um, the Road and Bridge Department for making this happen. It's, it's all good news. Okay. Madam Chair, move approval. Second. Okay, Madam Secretary, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what, what we're going to do is we're going to flip this real quick for just a second. Um, we are going to go ahead and move to, let me find it. We're going to do the Chuck Seafood item two under the county attorney B2. We're gonna move that, we're gonna do it right now. 
because Judge Angelos does have something that she needs to get back to, and then we'll jump back to the regular scheduled agenda. If y'all don't mind. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as you indicated, this item relates to uh, Chuck Seafood. It's actually uh, permission to advertise. <clears throat> Uh, the board discussed this, I believe, uh, last week uh, at the informal meeting. The county owns the property uh, known as Chuck Seafood, located on the island. We currently lease the property to a tenant who's operated a restaurant there for over 20 years. We have in the past and uh, currently have discussed the possibility of selling that property, but to date we've not made any decisions to sell the property and we're in fact looking at doing some due diligence and doing appraisals to determine whether it's in our best interest to do that. The current tenant has expanded substantial sums to renovate the restaurant and desires to obtain a right of first refusal in the event the board determines to sell the property. The current tenant also uses a portion of the adjacent fire station property for parking. The county, just in way of background, donated this property to the fire district in 1965 the deed conveying that property contains a reverter clause that would require reconveyance of the property to the county in the event of non-use by the district. The uh, county statutes provide, or excuse me, state statutes provide for the sale of county property to the highest and best bidder, but don't provide for a right of first refusal. The, the section of the statute does authorize a county to adopt alternate procedures for the sale of or lease of county property. We've done that in the past as an example for the Airport West property. In this regard, attached is a draft ordinance which if adopted would uh, provide an alternate procedure to sell the Chuck Seafood property. And it would also include, <coughs> if we ever acquire the fire district property, it would inc include uh, that property as well. Uh, of course, if we didn't, it wouldn't. The ordinance provides that the existing tenant with a right of first refusal that would allow the existing tenant the right to match the highest and best bid or proposal. And again, this is just permission to advertise. In my mind, this is separate from the issue of sale. Um, you could decide to sell. You could decide not to sell. You could decide to sell 10 years from now. In my mind, um, we really should proceed, at least with certainly with the public hearing, um, giving the existing tenant the right of first refusal uh, acknowledging the investment that they've made in the property. Staff recommends approval. Is there any board discussion or comment? Not hearing okay. any. Commissioner Zadosky, did you want to I say was just something? Saying, I was saying that there, there was no motion to, uh, no one to discuss, and uh, there are folks in the audience uh, for public hearing. You wanted to open it to the Public it's not a public hearing. Right. It, it's it, not a public hearing. It's a regular agenda it's item. It's just permission to advertise. Oh, so you moved it up. My bad. Right. I did put it on the regular agenda because of the board discussion. I thought it would be appropriate to put it on the regular agenda, but it is permission to advertise. So it, in other words, this will be coming back to you at a public hearing, and you'll have uh, additional opportunity to comment <laughs> at that time and sort and listen to public comment. But again, staff does recommend permission to advertise. Right. Madam Chair, I'll make a Madam motion to Chair. approve. Okay, so I'm saying that Commissioner Zadowski made the motion with Commissioner Bartz as the second. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, call the roll, please. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we'll go back to the um, agenda nine, public hearing county attorney. Um, for the special public event sites. Right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assistant County Attorney Catherine Barbieri will be handling this item. Madam Chair, Commissioners, for the record, Assistant County Attorney Catherine Barbieri, what you have before you is the second of two public hearings creating section. 8020211 for special public event sites. On December 4, 2018, the Board of County Commissioners adopted an ordinance which amended the St. Lucie County Land Development Code temporary uses by amending the requirements of paragraph J 
authorizing special vehicles, recreational vehicle, motorcycle, and boat sale events on site. The ordinance withdrew the ability of the planning and development director to approve special public events on property, including the fairgrounds. This has prevented special event expositions from taking place in St. Lucie County. This ordinance acknowledges the public interest to have special event expositions, but the need to have them take place on large tracts of land where they can provide the services and facilities for these unique usages. Standards will be adopted by this board by resolution that I'll come back to you. This ordinance was advertised in the newspaper on August 7th. This is a public hearing and staff is recommending the board approve the proposed draft ordinance. Is there any questions by any of the board before I open it up to public? Hearing none, we'll open this up to public hearing. Is there anybody wishing to come forward at this time? Doesn't appear to be, Madam Chair. Thank you. We'll close public comment. We'll come back to the board. Madam Chair, move approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. Madam Secretary, I think you got that. Commissioner Hutchinson made the motion with Commissioner Mitchell second. Can you call the roll, please? Commissioner Barks. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchison. Yes, ma'am. And Chair Townsend. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We'll move to the next item. Next item would be uh, planning and development mm -hmm. services B1. That's a paving waiver proposed uh, Drawdy South Header Island Canal North Subdivision. Yeah, is Grant there? They're coming up. Okay, he's up here. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. For the record, my name is uh, Chris McCrane, Associate Planner with the Planning and Development Services Department. Um, I have Grant Chambers with the Public Works Department next to me. <coughs> um, we are presenting the request for Drowdy Brothers Investment LLLP for a road paving waiver. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial public hearing. Uh, adver advertisement for the public hearing was placed in the St. Lucie uh, Tribune on August 8, 2020, and mail notices were sent to property owners within 500 feet of the subject property. Uh, the collective 47.06 acre parcel is located on the west side of South Header Canal Road um, at the southwest corner of Header Canal Road and Okeechobee Pol uh, Road. The uh, applicant has submitted a preliminary site plan proposing to sub subdivide the property into five parcels each in excess of eight acres in size. Uh, the proposed site plan provides for individual drive driveway access to each of the lots from the South Header Canal Road. South Header Canal Road is a county owned and maintained, but substandard right away. Um, the existing asphalt travel way is approximately 22 to 24 feet in width with unimproved shoulders. Uh, county standards require an 11 foot wide travel lane in each direction with a five foot stabilized or paved sh um, shoulders. Uh, the land development code requires access to new developments, public or private, to be paved in accordance with the county's spe specifications. Develop developments determined to be small traffic generators defined less than um, 100 trips daily may request a paving waiver. Uh, the applicant is requesting a waiver from the paving requirements as well as the proportionate share, fair share requirements in accordance with section 70507E2 uh, of the Land Development Code. In each lot, if each lot is de uh, developed as single family residential, the proposed site plan would be a small traffic generator generating less than 100 trips per day. The section allows for the Board of County Commissioners to waive the paving requirements for small traffic generators following a public hearing if the board determines the following. Number one, that the road paving is not essential to provide adequate access to the proposed development and through the surrounding area. 
or that the road will be paved as part of the county's five-year pro road program or an approved municipal service taxing or benefit unit. Or number three, that the access road does not have adequate right-of-way in which to construct the, the necessary paving improvements in accordance with the county standards. The options for granting the waiver allow for the board to attach conditions as deemed necessary to minimize the impacts of the road on the surrounding area, including but not limited to the payment by the developer or the developer's fair share of paving costs for the unpaved roadway, providing access to the, the development. The fair share contribution for Drowdy Brothers Investments uh, road frontage to the closest paved road, that is Okeechobee Road, is $237,728. South Hedder Canal is not currently listed on the county's road improvement schedule. The county does not have South Hedder Canal in its five-year uh, plan for paving, and improvements to county standards are not accounted for in the county's budget. South Hedder Canal Road is currently a county-owned and maintained, but unimproved, and the existing right-of-way width is sufficient to meeting the county standards. The applicant has provided a proportionate fair share analysis in requesting a waiver from paving and a waiver from the fair share fee in lieu of paving. The provision in criteria number two and three outlined in 70507B2A are not applicable to this proposed subdivision. The county staff has reviewed the existing site conditions and adjacent sites and supports the applicant's request. Based on the low intensity of the roadway and the roadway not being on the county's list of roadways to be improved, staff recommends granting a waiver subject to the following condition of approval. That the current and future owners and their heirs, uh, assignees, or agrees to participate and shall be a yes vote in any lawfully established MSTU or MSBU or special assessments district created for the purpose of providing paving and or drainage improvements to South Hedder Canal. This concludes staff's presentation. Dean Grant are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Does the board have any questions? Madam Chair, uh, Chris, uh, if the, this uh, set of properties after uh, separation and the paver waiver, if they come back with another use, uh, say some type of commercial operation, a uh, I don't know, distribution where the uh, trips on the road uh, become greater, will they have to come back to the board for approval or to be participatory in uh, paving um, or contributing to? I think it depends on the actual use itself, okay. whether or not it would be conditional use to come to the board, but if it was a minor site plan. Okay, well, the reason, the reason why I, I, this is one of, I think, three or four that have either come through uh, or are coming through, and my concern is that we continue to, to support the sins of the past. And I'll, what I'll say is, you know, there are areas of the county that are green space, and, and uh, there are a lot of folks think that it's inexpensive to, to just separate some property and, and build a house and so on. But what happens is, and what's historically happened, is communities get built one house at a time or two houses or four houses at a time, uh, often on dirt roads. And then, you know, 10, 20, 30 years later, they come back and they want the taxpayers to pay for uh, the municipal improvements uh, to the to those types of neighborhoods, and uh, we've got to come up with a a policy that gives you all an opportunity to bring back to us uh, something that is somewhere in between. I understand two hundred and some thousand dollars to separate several properties is probably a burden uh, on those properties. But what happens is, uh, I'll use Fort Saint Lucie as an example. Uh, most of their areas are PUDs, where the cost of building a home and the infrastructure is built into the cost of the home. Well, when we build these uh, neighborhoods, one at a time, two, five, six at a time, what happens over a course of decades is you get a neighborhood with dirt roads, and then it becomes a burden on the taxpayers later on. You get to build the house inexpensively to start, but then down the road, no pun intended, there's a cost associated with infrastructure, drainage and roadways and, and uh, et, et cetera. So uh, I, I supported the one last week uh, with the, with the uh, caveat that the planning department uh, can come together, bring us a policy with the, uh, with the uh, uh, attorney's office so that we're legal, but we get some provision back the other direction uh, so that there's another option other than 
what we're doing here because all we're doing is continuing the sins of the past. And I see uh, Lord, Director Olson coming forward. Ma'am. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners. You will be seeing um, a proposed text amendment come before you uh, prior to the end of the year uh, with recommendations for how to proceed with a rural type of subdivision. So the existing type of subdivision will still be available, um, but what we would like to provide is for owners who choose to subdivide our agricultural lands with much less density than what would be allowed, significantly less density, um, and not be a large traffic generator, and then they would not need to go through this process because they would be creating, instead of um, state subdivisions, really, it would, it would be more like a small farm um, and a hobby farm because the, the lands would be significantly larger and create significantly less impact on the roads. We're working through all those issues with legal. We're drafting um, proposed language for you, but that would be a benefit to those landowners who would divide into larger parcels and have less impact on the roadways. And then this other process would still be available where the commissioners could consider whether or not they should pay for that because they are subdividing to the maximum density allowed. So that you will see that before the end of the year. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the time. I, I just did, you know, having having had, uh, you know, uh, had never a number of neighborhoods in in my district specifically, and I know that Commissioner Hutchinson has uh, a similar situation in parts of her district. Is that you know, once these houses are built, you know, the the dirt roads become a a, a problem. The dirt, the dust, the noise, the grading, the maintenance, all those things. So. Uh, I'm glad that you're working on it. I appreciate that, and so that I will uh, I'll stop talking and wait to hear from my commissioners and uh, the applicant. And you said this was quasi judicial, so I have only met with staff today. Yes, since then. Okay, I was going to say I had that it was not a quasi judicial item, but since they're saying it is, is there any disclosures from any other board members? Ma'am, I've only met with staff. This is Sean saying. Okay. Same, Commissioner Bart. Same, Commissioner Townsend. Okay. So, is let's open it up to the public. Is there anybody from the public wishing to come forward? Good after, Good morning, there, um, Madam Chair, Commissioners. For the record, Brad Curry with EDC representing the applicant. Staff did an excellent job presenting. We are in agreement with the condition, and we request approval of the request before you. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Is anybody else wishing to come forward under public comment? Seeing no one come forward, Madam Chair. Thank you. We'll close public comment. We'll come back to the board. Is there a motion? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Madam Secretary, Commissioner Bartz and um, Commissioner Mitchell with the second. Would you call the roll, please? Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. We'll go to item two. This is the South subdivision. So, I, um, Chris, I think this is all the same. It is, except for the cost. It's the property just Correct. to the south of the north, which is the previous presentation we gave. Correct. You just want to, for the record, to state the cost and the, cha the few changes? Yeah, so the condition is going to remain the same as the previous presentation. Um, the only difference would be the cost, which in this case, it's um, the fair share would be 488978 And I'll also mention that this is a uh, six-lot subdivision with uh, an exemption from platting, whereas the last one was a five-lot subdivision with a plat. Okay, and I'm having this as not quasi-judicial, but you're probably stating that it is. So is there any board members? Um, I've just talked with staff. Commissioner Mitchell, staff. Zidofsky, talk to staff. Commissioner Hutchinson, staff only. Art, um, staff as well. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, is there any other questions before I open up to public comment? All right, we'll open up the public comment. Is there anybody wishing to come forward? Again, I'm sorry, but Brad Curry with EDC, representing the applicant. Uh, we reviewed the staff report and we are in agreement with the condition and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Anybody else? See no movement for uh, public comment. Thank Madam you. Plus public comment. Thank you, Commissioner Zadowski. Um, I'll come back to the board. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Okay. Commissioner Bartz made the motion. Commissioner Mitchell second. Madam Secretary, call the roll, please. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. We'll go to the regular agenda item 10A, Mr. Tipton with the COVID update. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, item 10A1 is, a, uh, is an update on uh, the uh, pandemic that we've been dealing with here locally since March 17th of this year. Uh, staff has been providing the board with weekly updates regarding the status of the virus in our community. And the good news is that after a difficult June and July, the numbers are slowly trending in a better direction. Uh, the numbers for the month just ended were particularly challenging with cases increasing by 190% in fatal fatalities that grew by 86% all records for the month. So some good news is welcome news. Uh, as of this morning, and this is from the health department, uh, St. Lucie County stands at 6,327 uh, cases with 206 fatalities. The trend line for COVID-19-like COVID -like illnesses being presented at the hospitals has been trending down, as has influenza-like illnesses. The 14-day positive rate stands at 10.1%, which, while still high, is more than three percentage points lower than just a few weeks ago. Following the CDC recommendations, with the, additional, uh, with the addition of requiring face coverings, since the middle of July appears to be making a difference in our numbers locally. And some additional good news, our COVID hospitaliza hospitalizations are also trending down. In terms of reopening, engaging where we are as a community, it's important to note that there isn't just one number or indicator that is a determining factor. We are utilizing the governor's gating criteria, which is, updating, uh, which is updated for us locally by the health department. This gating criteria is based off of the White House's Opening Up America guidelines. We are also looking at the CDC, Surgeon General of Florida, University of Florida, and our health department, our medical providers, and our hospitals for their input and guidance. County facilities generally remain, generally remain on a limited access basis with people encouraged to conduct business virtually, if at all possible. Following the CDC uh, guidelines and face covering requirements, the county has reopened two libraries while providing curbside service in others. Staff has met on August 14th to review the reopening of other library locations. Planning and development has maintained <coughs> operations throughout the pandemic using modified work arrangements to keep staff and customers safe and have recently relocated uh, the intake process to a better and safer location. Park staff met on August 12th to discuss facility events and reopening plans. Parks has reopened pools by appointment and baseball tournaments have started with challenges on face coverings and social distancing that are being addressed. Clover Park remains closed and the Fence Center will begin to offer events in September working through the issues of crowd size and crowd management limitations. Sunshine Kitchen is still largely occupied by the Treasure Coast Food Bank. However, staff is working with them to free up space for other commercial opportunities. Um, uh, let's see. Schools open uh, to about 50% capacities on August 24th. Staff is working with the Children's Services Council to provide alternative solutions. Uh, this is through the CARES Act funding for individuals. Uh, this would be first responders, medical providers, essential employees, and the general public with some qualifying conditions whose children will be attending virtually while they are at work. According to one of our hospital CEOs, we can expect to see an increase in overall illnesses as school starts, something the community health experiences every year. School staff and students will be required by the school board to wear face coverings. 
uh, some CARES Act funding updates. Uh, as a reminder, uh, this is a $55 million uh, funding that has come down from the federal government through the Florida Department of Emergency Management to St. Lucie County. County in turn is working with our cities and other governmental agencies to help get this money into the community as quickly as possible with the goal of having it spent by December the 31st of this year. <coughs> if you are an individual or small business that has been negatively impacted from COVID-19, there are opportunities to receive one-time assistance. For the individual assistance program, which is up to $4,000 to help meet rent, mortgage, utility payments, and so on, the county has already received more than 3,100 applications. For small business assistance, the county is working through the Economic Development Council of St. Lucie County to provide one-time assistance up to $7,500 for costs relating to reopening, related to providing for safety measures or rent, utilities, and insurance premiums. To date, we have received over 382 applications. In the coming weeks, we will be introducing the following initiatives. Uh, there will be some workforce training in partnership with CareerSource, assistance to not-for-profit organizations to include places of worship in partnership with the United Way, and as I mentioned, temporary community child assistance in partnership with the Children's Services Council, nutritious meal program, uh, senior at risk population in partnership with the Treasure Coast Food Bank, and then last, homeless COVID-19 assistance in partnership also uh, with the Treasure Coast Homeless Services Council. Our goal has been uh, to place this funding in our community that directly benefits our residents and our businesses. And we encourage everybody for more information to go to recoverstlucy.org. <coughs> Madam Chair, that concludes my update. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tifton, do we have an approximate date as to when the kitchen is going to be open again to businesses to come back? Uh, I know that Mr. Satterley has been working on that, and I would ask him to come up. I know that uh, they had a meeting uh, either late last week or, or yesterday uh, on that very subject. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mark Satterley, Deputy County Administrator. Yes, um, we've had a, a couple of meetings uh, with, uh, with Regina McCants. Uh, Doug Baber's been helping out. Doug has extensive experience in the hospitality industry, <coughs> and food and beverage, and, um, and also meeting with uh, Judy Cruz of the Food Bank and talking about uh, soft reopening of the, uh, of the kitchen to our clients, um, you know, with a mind or an eye towards making sure that everybody that comes is safe. We're looking probably right around the middle of September to get everything in order. Uh, we'll have uh, people test, uh, doing testing, uh, temper taking temperatures, doing the cleaning like we, like we do in the county administration building. So kind of getting all of that in place and then working with our, with our, uh, our potential clients who would be coming back, to make sure they understand <coughs> that there'll be some new protocols, there'll be some distancing, uh, much more rigorous cleaning uh, requirements for the kitchen. Um, since the food bank has been there, they have kept it exceptionally clean, and we're very thankful for that. Um, and so that's kind of the quick update, but we are working towards uh, bringing back some, our clients, albeit, you know, um, with uh, all of the, cl the cleaning and distancing protocols. Okay, thank you. Does the board ha have any questions? Madam Chair, um, if I could, in this more just a comment, um, thank you, Mr. Tipton, for bringing, you know, an update like this. We, I know, as you mentioned, we do get your reports for the public to be able to hear it because that seems to be the next question is how much longer, you know, we're staying in this. And then at least in mine and your discussions yesterday, um, it appears that if our numbers continue to go down, like you mentioned, there's not a magic number that we can hang our hat on it's basically the overall trend is like the way I'm understanding it. Um, but having said that, I would appreciate if even next month you could bring back another report, especially if we're going to start looking at opening up our buildings, which I hope we're doing. And I know that's one of the next things on the list. So I'll hold my other comments for when we hit that agenda item. But I think it's important so that we can keep the public informed of what's going on. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner Hutchinson. Yeah, we have, uh, we look forward to the update. Uh, and, and one of the important things to, to emphasize in, in the report this morning 
is that we, we were in a, a tough spot 30 days ago. We, we were seeing some numbers uh, and, and a trend in some of the numbers that were, that were difficult. Uh, this board uh, took the action to, to look at face coverings and making them a requirement. And that, along with some of the other measures that had previously been taken, uh, I, I think are really making a difference. And from our hospital administrators, from our health department, uh, from our infectious disease doctors, uh, there is there is still a, a great deal of support for continuing this path forward. Uh, and so it, it's making a difference and, and I appreciate those comments. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on to County Attorney. Thank you, Madam Chair. This item uh, really ties into the prior discussion and it was actually discussed briefly by uh, Mr. Tipton but it has to do with reopening the Fenn Center for public events. Uh, the board uh, did uh, ratify Mr. Tipton's March order that reduced the county operations and closed county facilities as he indicated, including the Fenn Center. Uh, Madam Chair, you indicated that you'd like the board to have the opportunity to discuss reopening the Fenn Center to public events. I believe in Mr. Tipton's comments a few minutes ago, uh, <coughs> that he indicated from his perspective that they would open the Fence Center in the middle of September, I thought he said, uh, uh, with protocols in place. And so with that as sort of a background, I think you wanted the board again to have the opportunity to discuss the issue. Uh, certainly staff's available to answer any questions, but I think at this point, um, if the board could just sort of weigh in on the Fence Center reopening, um, again, the middle of September is what staff was recommending. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so Mr. Tipton, and I'm sure that Parks and Rex is there as well. Um, when we begin to reopen the Fence Center, is there going to be specific events that won't be allowed, or are we going to open it up, and as long as all the protocol is met according to what we are going to request, and if they have stuff in line to follow, will it be opening to everything that's been booked? Yes, ma'am, and, and Ed Matthews is here as well. Uh, so what we're looking at is, is we're looking at, at, at events that, that we can uh, manage with, with the right protocols. They, they must present a plan uh, to staff uh, that, that demonstrates they have the ability to manage uh, the, the crowd sizes. That's one of the things that, that we're, we're looking at is the, the, uh, the event space for the Fen Center can hold 4,000 people. That is a crowd size that right now uh, we don't want to see. And so uh, determining the right size of the crowd, determining how that crowd would be spaced out, uh, the ability as, uh, in terms of the protocols for coming into the building, when we've reached that capacity, how are the crowds going to be maintained outside? Um, and so all of those things are, are in play. Uh, and then I think it will be, as, as Mr. Matthews and I have discussed, there's going to be, at least in the initial period, uh, some additional staffing requirements to just make sure that we have the compliance necessary because the last thing we want to see is some kind of a cluster that comes from an event that we have hosted. And so we want to make sure that we're following through on that. But yes, we, we, are, we are looking for uh, those events. As you know, we, uh, <coughs> I think the, the Fen Center staff has been chomping at the bit to, uh, to get our facilities reopened. This is, they, they are used to making money and, and helping the community and it's been a strange time for them. Uh, and so we just want to make sure that we're doing it, we're doing it carefully and thoughtfully uh, in, in, in thinking about people's safety first. No, I agree. But so uh, like the gun show, that's a lot of people that employ themselves to having those booths. And it's, as you said, it's revenue for the taxpayers for the Fence Center. So there has been questions about the gun show being able to be there and they have to advertise appropriately. So is the gun show... Um, going to be allowed or is this going to be one that's going to be looked at to be deterred to not happen? Can you give some insight on that, please? Sure. Um, and, and again, uh, we, we, have been, we have been discussing the, the various types of shows. Uh, actually, Mr. Matthews went to the uh, gun show down in Martin County uh, on Saturday of this past week to kind of get a, uh, an understanding of, uh, of how that went. Uh, I think uh, to... Um, to reflect on his comments, I think that would be something that we, uh, in terms of the way that was handled, it would not be something that we would like to see here. Uh, there was, uh, I believe, somewhere around uh, 
50% uh, face mask coverings. Uh, it was uh, not an air conditioned space. It was just a, it was a very crowded space and it was a very difficult setup. So I think with the right uh, circumstances, absolutely. And any type of a trade show event, including a gun show uh, would be possible. Okay, because I just know that there has been some people inquire about that and they need to advertise because they have booths and stuff. And I know that they've cut the normal booths that they normally have down to half to try to meet the criteria for everything for COVID. And they, they've they been calling the office wanting to know if the Fin Center was going to open up because they need to start advertising. Yes, ma'am. We're, we're looking at, for that particular type of event, we'd probably be looking at about 12.5% of our, our available space, which would be about 500 people. That would be the maximum capacity. Um, and so, yes, we, we, are, we are looking to that. It's, it's, just, it's just managing. And remember, our, our numbers are higher here in St. Lucie County than they have been in our uh, counties to the north and the south of us. Um, we still, as of this morning, are still slightly over 10%, which is, you know, one of those, one of the indicators that, that causes some concern with, with moving forward with some events. But we are, we are hopeful by the time we get into mid-September, late September, that, that we can start looking at, at, at hosting these types of events. Okay, thank you. Is, is there any other questions or comments Madam, from the board? Madam Chair, since we're on the subject of the Fen Center, can I add in, you know, I've got the same kind of concerns and would like to be the th issues out at the fairgrounds for usage out there. Um, again, that's a revenue source for the county. It's an open space in most cases that the fairgrounds actually also be included. Um, we've got some of our 4-H groups that need to start their meetings and that's a good place out there in the arena for them to meet. There's, it's open. It's easily spaced out. Um, presently, they meet there at the Hurricane Center. So, I mean, even to bring the revenue sources in, because you like you said, some of those events have to start advertising. And I know I've had to work with Mr. Matthews on a bike riding cycle group that's been in and out there and has had to change their um, advertising and stuff because the protocols weren't appropriate or turned in. And it's been a mess with them also. And having said that, since we're talking about facilities, and again, Mr. Tipton and I, you and I discussed this yesterday, in regards to this, I know we still presently have four libraries shut. That is correct. And I don't know if there's a way that we can start bringing those online for that September. And my reason for this is with the start of school and it's still split my understanding, you know, half the kids are going to actually be in school in the buildings, the other half will be doing it remotely. Um, but our libraries are very highly used and you've got a lot of families that may not, no longer be able to afford a Wi-Fi bill that have in the past had spotty coverage and have to been, I've been told of many that have gone and sit in parking lots so that they can get coverage. But I'd like to see if we could start opening up some of those schools that would at least give a place for students to go attend. And I think that's gonna take a partnership with the school board itself, those that may be learning virtually versus going in the classroom. But at least at the library, you know, they've got the quiet, they've got the ability to space in some areas or, you know, partition office section so that it could only be strictly for students to use. Thank you, Commissioner Hutchinson. We, we did speak about that yesterday, and I know Susan Jacob is here uh, this morning, our library director. Um, we are looking to open up all four libraries, remaining libraries in the month of September, and so we will be bringing those online. I, I, I would like to recognize uh, Susan's staff, who have, uh, many of have been redeployed uh, during this pandemic, as you'll recall. Uh, she has virtually all of them back now, and so we are now in a position where we can start to do that. So we look forward to that. Also, uh, our, our Deputy County Administrator, uh, Alfonso Jefferson, uh, with the CARES Act funding has been working with the school board to look at kind of a broadband solution that can look at a countywide uh, effort to make sure that we have the, that type of Wi-Fi, that type of connectivity available to in our community. And so we are looking at that as well in, in partnership with the school board. Thank you. Anybody else have Mr. any comments? Mr. Tipton, was that a, uh, a play on words when you said you have the librarians virtually all back? 
virtually all back. Yes, sir. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but thank you. Uh, Madam Chair Zadowski, um, I'm cautiously optimistic about the numbers. I, I, I don't think we've had a long enough trend, a uh, downward trend, uh, to be uh, prepared to open, uh, and I'm going to say as quickly. I understand what we're trying to accomplish, and I, I want to accomplish it too. I, I want to be there, you know, as open as we can be, but as safe as we can be. So as part of that conversation, I know the guidelines are being created, agreements will be made, um, and, and I hope that there's a, a strong agreement that is uh, created that holds the county harmless. And that's a, that's a, a legal question over there, uh, Mr. McIntyre, because if we have a situation and we have a spike and we've held and hosted, as earlier stated, uh, an event that uh, the event makers choose not to follow uh, the guidelines, uh, then where does that put us in a liability uh, perspective? The goal here for, for me is to protect the taxpayers from any uh, liability that may occur uh, if event makers don't follow the, uh, the guidelines. We do have agreements with the vendors. Uh, they typically, I think, have indemnification in there. We can take a look at that, though. That's a good point. Uh, we can make sure that uh, we put language in there. We might even want to talk about signage, uh, masks um, uh, required or encouraged, uh, social distancing encouraged, uh, those kinds of things. Um, Again, we can talk about those are operational issues, but they're consistent with what we want to do. That's a good point, and we'll we'll certainly take that under consideration. Well, you heard today from a from a, a citizen uh, who had some concerns, who wanted to participate in an event, uh, but she was unable to because the event uh, itself uh, didn't follow uh, a set of guidelines. And so, I think there are a lot of people who want to get out and want to participate, but they also want to feel safe. Uh, not only for themselves, but for whoever else is next to them. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. It's been life, health, and safety is what we've always tried to manage uh, as a board and as a, as a county uh, government. So right. that's my That's right. And, and you'll recall when we did the mask ordinance, or, or we tried to do it for civil penalties only, um, and we tried to encourage education. And I think that's what the, the law enforcement agencies are trying to do. Uh, at some point, though, the the um, the tool is there if they want to use it, but the board really doesn't have any control over what the law enforcement agencies in the city or uh, even the sheriff, he's an independent constitutional officer, they have to make their own independent judgments. I think they're doing what, what we wanted them to do, which is encourage people to do the right thing through education and warnings. At some point, uh, that may need to change. That'll be, of course, up to them. Commissioner Sadowski, just to add to that, um, one of the things that we have focused on is trying to make sure that we get the information out there and that we, we create this, this flow of information. And uh, to that point, for the baseball tournaments that we've had mm -hmm. recently where we were having some challenges with uh, some of the uh, youngsters out there and, and some of the uh, parents as well, uh, we have, uh, we've got some palm cards now that show what social distancing looks like. So it's got the, the basic information on it that we can give to the promoters, to the teams, and, uh, and then also requiring the promoters to make sure that they are following up. And, and then, we, again, from an additional staffing perspective, making sure that we're going out there and making sure that there's compliance. So it's, it's information, it's education, and then it's just making sure that there's follow-up. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've shared my concerns. Okay, and the other thing, too, is I just want to comment. I was at that Back to Blue event. There was people there with mask on. There was people without mask on. But for somebody to not have participated because they didn't have mask on, those that had the mask that wanted to participate, they stayed and they went last. They walked last and they stayed you know, six to 10 feet away from others. So to say that you couldn't attend an event because people didn't have on mask, I don't think is fair. That was a wonderful event. And no matter if you had on a mask or not, there was a way for you to participate. I think in a closed building, there's a little bit more control, obviously, because, you know, there's one way in and one way out. But, um, you know, Commissioner Zadowski, I agree with you. I think we all agree with you. But I think that also it's a matter of 
our own personal preferences and, and what we choose to do too. So if, for example, the gun show, the gun show, there's going to be signs at the door. There's protocol that has to be met. If they don't meet it, then it's not going to happen. And they're only going to be hurting themselves. And if you choose to go to something just like me, if I, if I want to go to something and don't want to wear a mask, then it's mandatory that I choose to not go if it's the other way around. So I think that this county has done a great job with our mask ordinance, which also brings up a point, Mr. Tipton, could you please state so that the general public can understand, I'm receiving a lot of phone calls that they felt that the mask mandate was gonna be ending. Uh, they were going on based on what, you were, what your ordinance was when you put it into effect. I've tried to explain to everybody that this board put up an ordinance with the civil penalties and it's in effect until we get out of the state of the emergency and we're released from the governor that there is no 30 days. And the reason why the board did this is so that we would not have to continuously have this conversation and it's in effect until we're released from the state of the emergency. So could you just um, clarify that please? Madam Chair, thank you. Actually, I think you just did a very good job. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, the initial executive order that, that I issued yeah. did have a 30 day limitation on it. And when the, uh, which would have been, I think August 15th is when that would have expired, which is why I think people were getting confused. Yes. When the board took its action to create an, an ordinance with the civil penalties, as Mr. McIntyre reminded us, um, that replaced the executive order. And there's no expiration on that other than it is tied to the expiration of the state of emergency that uh, has been declared. Additionally, the board, if our numbers continue to trend uh, for a long enough period of time in a real positive direction, the board can end uh, that requirement uh, prior to the expiration of the uh, declaration of emergency as well. So um, it, it's, I don't see it happening in the, in the near future. We wanna continue to stay strong and follow our CDC recommendations and our medical provider recommendations, but but it, there is uh, there are it, it is not in the near term, and it, it and there is not a date specific for it. Okay, thank you. I just know that if I was receiving the calls, I'm sure the other commissioners were too. So I want to take advantage of this time. Uh, is there any other comments, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, a couple things. First of all, I'm very hopeful that we mm -hmm. will be able to open. But as Commissioner Zdowski said, also very cautious. Um, I think the idea of being able to put in contract that we are going to be held um, harmless, I think that's an important piece. Um, we right now have an ordinance that says that government buildings will have masks and social distance. I'm going to ask Mr. McIntyre, can we request this of the um, organizations that would want to sign up at the Fen Center? Also, I would like to ask him, um, if there will be a um, part of the contract that will say, if for some reasons our numbers are spiking and we don't feel um, that it's the right time to open, will there be something in the contract? Because unfortunately the vendors are going to go through a lot of costs for signage and advertising. And I don't have a problem with anybody wanting to go in there. I just wanna make sure that we are uh, following our own rules. Right, the, the answer to your first question is, uh, which was, I believe, uh, we have actually, I think the, uh, the county administrator issued an emergency order on, that, on the uh, county buildings requiring face masks and social distancing and so, Anybody who comes into that county building will re be required to wear a face mask and do social distancing. But uh, and as I answered Commissioner Zadowski, I think it would be a good idea to incorporate that into our contract with the vendor so that there's, there's, no, um, there's no doubt about that, that it's upfront about it. In terms of the question about whether, uh, what we would do in terms of if the, if the numbers go, go in a different direction, 
we, we really need to make sure that we are comfortable before we open because as you indicated, uh, and I think other commissioners indicated, there's a lot of costs involved in advertising these events. And if we canceled them after they incurred that cost, it would likely be a result that we would end up having to, to offset those costs uh, ourselves. We'd have to pay them back for that if we on our own canceled the meeting. So uh, we need to make, make sure we're comfortable before we, we give the green light. Um, Otherwise, I mean, I think we can certainly put in there that we can cancel the event, but there might be financial consequences. We've had this happen before, not during the COVID, where we've canceled an event um, at a different venue and we ended up having to pay the cost of the advertising. So that's, that's, that's the answer, I think. Madam Chair, I have a question. This is Sean. Would it be just like, I'm just giving you a hypothetical, Mr. McIntyre. If we had a hurricane come and say, and we had to cancel the event because of a hurricane, would this fall into that realm also? Of course, Mr. Chairman. Well, that would be, uh, that would, that, that's, that's a different type of uh, cancellation. That's uh, like what they would call a for act of God, force majeure. Um, there you would probably be under a state of emergency. We'd be closing down all county buildings and shuttering. I, I took Commissioner Bartz's question to be that the county would on its own decide that we, we just didn't want events there um, down the road. And we can certainly put that language in the, in the contract to give us that flexibility, but it, it might have financial consequences. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'm not sure that I've communicated that question um, appropriately, but my thought is, that we are in a state of emergency. We have, this is very public because it is a public health crisis and it's a global pandemic. So my question was, anybody who wants to contract for that should be aware that if our numbers go up, that something may have to be canceled. So that was why I was asking if there should be anything. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you do it 10 days before. Um, and I do understand that whoever that is will have incurred some costs. So I'm not looking to put uh, the burden on them, but as well as I want to make sure that the county is protected. Sure. So not sure. knowing what sure. those I, costs would be. I think we can clearly address your, the issue that you raised by adding language in there that gives us the flexibility to terminate if we need to, um, indicating that we're under a state of emergency. But I do also think that there could be financial consequences to that. I just want to be upfront about that. So um, maybe, maybe not. It depends on the circumstances. In a hurricane, uh, probably not. Um, but. Yes, we can try to address uh, the concerns raised by both you and Commissioner Zadowski in the agreement, and we should do that. Madam Chair, Mr. Matthews is at the podium if you'd like to speak to him. Thank you, uh, Commissioners. Madam Chair, Ed Matthews, Director of Parks and Recreation. A couple of issues came up during your discussions, and I may have some information that will help clarify those. Uh, number one, we do have an addendum, which we worked through with Catherine Barbieri, which is attached to all of our facility use agreements. The additional information you're requesting now, we'll have to work uh, with legal to see about uh, the cancellation policy, you know, if it's our call to, uh, to close the event because of COVID numbers. Uh, that has not been addressed. When it comes to the 4-H uh, utilization, uh, because of the the hurricane house limitations, mm -hmm. we are addressing that. That's no problem. Uh, been in touch with uh, 4-H yesterday. Also, the explorers and the with the sheriff's office, they're mm -hmm. facing a similar situation with COVID uh, social distancing issues to do their training. We're making mm -hmm. accommodations at the fairgrounds. Uh, we have ample space, air conditioned space. So uh, both of those youth groups uh, will be able to accommodate. The other thing I just wanted to give you in terms of data-driven decision-making, um, the Fence Center has, uh, we have available uh, 40,000 square feet of space. And when you do the math and you're using um, the number of people that would be going in there, 
CDC guidelines require uh, the six foot space. So in a circle using pi r squared, that's 28.12 uh, square feet. With the layout that we've developed working with the uh, most recent vendor, which is for the uh, gun show, our uh, safety space is 80 square feet. Uh, traffic control coming in would be strictly, um, you know, organized. And um, I think working with uh, the CDC guidelines, the mask rule, we have a 10-point checklist, <coughs> which is uh, going to be adhered to. Much of those came from the promoter, not from us. So our promoters, our youth groups, they seem to be very conscious of what our needs are. And I think the fact that the Fenn Center is a special needs shelter, we automatically have a heightened awareness when it comes to public safety. So those are some of the, the clarifiers there. Um, and um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Would provisions, Madam Chair, this is Commissioner <laughs> Mitchell, uh, would there be provisions made, say, if you've got an influx of people that want to come in, will we have it set up outside so there won't be a mad rush to the front door? That's a good question. <clears throat> yeah, the promoter is prepared to have someone at the gate limiting the first 500 people, which is really a very large number for our typical gun shows. <clears throat> the, um, as people leave, they'll have someone there counting, and then more people will come in. One of the other issues was food service, because that's a location where people could potentially congregate to get something to eat or drink. We're working with our food service folks to set up outside and not bring food and drink into the building. That should help with the crowd while they're waiting to come in and also after people leave. So that could actually help our food service folks there. Uh, hand sanitizers are going to be throughout the building. All of the video screens, if you go over right now, we're doing uh, primary voting. And uh, CARES Act is also operating. If you go there right now, there are three video screens in the lobby which are scrolling with CDC guidelines. There's hand sanitizers. The floor is marked out. It's a very, it's, a, it's, the staff at the Fenn Center have been doing this now for three months with census training, supervisor of election training. We've done work, uh, budget workshops. We've done HR training. They've been pretty well drilled up until this point working on uh, government focused uh, events. So now as we're going to be going into public events, I think the transition is good. Uh, our promoter seems diligent and dedicated and, and eager to make this work and, and work safely. So there, like I said, there's 10 elements <clears throat> that are in uh, the proposal that they provided to us. Uh, there's a couple little tweaking things we're going to do in there. Like I said, we're going to expand the footprint from just the, just the gymnasium to the, to the rooms on the side. So that's a, that's a huge increase in space and safety factor so that the aisles will be over 12 feet between any um, tables and, and displays. And one last question. Will they be offered, will there, us or the vendor provide masks in case somebody forgot a mask to bring to the event? Absolutely. We talked with staff yesterday. Uh, that discussion is going on with the promoter. If he runs out of masks, we'll be there to provide backup. Okay. We do you. have, uh, we do have. That's it, Madam masks. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank any you. other questions? Anybody else? Excuse me? Madam Chair. Commissioner first, of, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Matthews and the staff over at the Fen Center. Sounds like they have really been working hard on this. Um, and so that uh, we know that my, my concern is certainly any type of event that could go to the Fen Center. So I appreciate all the work that they have been doing to make sure that um, our vendors are compliant. The other thing I just wanted to quickly say, having uh, visited quite a few of the businesses in the area, I will say that the uh, common comments are that they are grateful that we have masks. They are grateful that their patrons have to wear masks. Um, they feel much better um, that they are wearing masks and the people that they are working with are wearing masks. So um, it's kind of nice to hear those kind of comments. 
because I've heard other comments as well. But um, anyways, that's all I had to say on that. Okay, anybody else? Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you, Mr. Tipton. Um, item two, we've already heard, so we'll move to item three. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, item three relates to a proposed ratification of County Administrator Order 20-53, which it would extend the certificates of public uh, convenience and necessity uh, through September 30th. Um, these are non-emergency transports. Um, the County Administrator earlier in the year extended those through July, I believe, and now is extending them through September. Staff recommends that the board adopt the resolution ratifying that decision. Is there any comments? Madam Chair, move approval. Thank you. Okay, Mr. okay so Madam Secretary, Ms. Commissioner Zadowski with the Commissioner Bartz a second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. We'll move to item four. Thank you, Mad Madam Chair. This item relates to the uh, port and actually the uh, agreement that we have with Director, and it also relates to two grants that we were able to uh, receive from the state, uh, which the board actually approved in May of this year. On May 19th, the board approved the, uh, the two FDOT grants. One was for a uh, rehabilitation uh, project on the port property, and the other would fund the rehabilitation of the South Dock area. Um, in our uh, lease agreement with Director that we signed uh, some time ago, back in April of, of 2019, uh, Director did agree to provide the local match. In other words, pay for that local match. Um, staff felt, I felt, that it was a more appropriate to actually, on the, on the grants, do a separate agreement so it's clear that they are required to pay the match. So we've developed an agreement which is attached to the agenda which would require a director to pay uh, the local match. The total, uh, the, the one match uh, for its uh, state contract G1K88, the local match in that case is $166,667. For state contract G1804, uh, that's a little different. That's a, like a 50-50 match. The state provides uh, $481,258.95, and the uh, local match on that would be uh, $481,258.95. And in the first uh, grant, the state was providing $500,000, so it was a different type of a, a grant. The total local match requirement is $647,000. $925.95. Again, the agreement that we have uh, proposing with director is that they would pay that amount uh, on behalf of the county consistent with the uh, lease and franchise agreement. Staff recommends approval. Thank you. Is there comments from the board? Yeah, Madam Chair Zadowski, uh, simply saying that it's good to see that uh, the Progress continues to happen at the port with director and the fact that these grants will be helpful to uh, move this along uh, and we're grateful to the state for uh, providing those uh, assistance and uh, look forward to seeing the work uh, get done. So thank you. Madam Chair, I'll move approval. I was just going to say that your motion. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, so Madam Secretary, with um, Commissioner Zadowski with Commissioner Hutchinson is the second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchinson? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. We'll move to item five. Madam Chair, this is also a, a proposed resolution ratifying order of the county administrator. Uh, we did. Uh, Earlier in, in March of this year, we authorized the use of com communications media technology, which we're utilizing today uh, for televised county public meetings. Uh, we, the administrator amended uh, those regulations to really just change the website uh, for televised county public meetings. Uh, that order that he signed was 20-51. We're proposing that the board ratify that 
through resolution 20-188. Staff recommends approval. <coughs> Would somebody from the board like to make a motion? Madam Chair, move approval. Second. Madam Secretary, I'm sure you got that. Commissioner Zadowski with Mitchell, second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Item six? Thank you, Madam Chair. This item is really re related. It's similar to the prior item, but this time it applies to non-televised county meetings. We Certain of our meetings are not televised, but we have similar protocols for using communication media technology. Again, the administrator in July of this year signed a, an order which changed the website link where the public would be able to submit questions. We have a proposed resolution 20-189 for you to ratify that order. Staff recommends approval. Pleasure of the board. Madam Chair, move for approval. Second. Madam Secretary, this is Commissioner Mitchell with Commissioner Hutchinson second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchinson? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We'll move to item seven. Thank you, Madam Chair. This item relates to Clover Park. It's an amendment to the architectural service agreement with Ewing Cole who are the design architects for the renovated project uh, that uh, we were able to at least uh, partially uh, view back in March. Uh, was It's closed now, has been previously indicated. Um, there's additional fee requests um, for different things, including our county, finishing the county offices, providing safety <coughs> railings, renovating the elevator, upgrading the staff maintenance building. Um, the total amount uh, is indicated in the board memo. The additional amount I, I, is uh, indicated as $47,520. Staff recommends approval. Any questions, comments? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Sadowski, thank you. And um, Commissioner Mitchell with the second. Madam Secretary, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We'll go to planning and services. Item C? Chris is coming up. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, for the record again, my name is Chris McCrane, Associate Planner with the Planning and Development Services Department. Um, today I'll be presenting the request of 7-Eleven Incorporated for a waiver of the wall requirements for self-service car washes. Uh, the vacant uh, 1.95 acre parcel is located on the northwest corner of Indrio Road and Kings Highway in Fort Pierce and is situated to the east of the Lakewood um, Park Residential Subdivision with a vacant commercial property located to the north. The Indrio Crossing Shopping Plaza is located to the east, and Chevron Gas Station Commercial Center and Rocket Gas Station are located to the south. Um, as seen on the zoning map, the subject property is located within the Commercial Neighborhood Zoning District, and the properties to the west are zoned Residential Single Family, or with a Commercial Neighborhood Zoning District to the, to the north. Properties to the south and east are a mixture of commercial neighborhood and commercial general. The applicant has submitted a wall waiver for the required eight foot masonry wall um, adjacent to the proposed self service car wash. The site currently includes a required eight foot masonry wall along the western property line as the commercial site is adjacent to residential properties to the west. Um, and an eight-foot masonry wall along the northern property line adjacent to the proposed self-service car wash. According to Land Development Code Section 71022F, the board may grant a, uh, a waiver from the requirement of an eight-foot masonry wall upon a determination that the adjacent property is zoned commercial and that the adjacent property owner consents to the removal of the wall. Uh, pursuant to these standards of review, the adjacent property to the north 
of the subject site is zoned commercial and the applicant has secured a consent from the adjacent property owner to remove the eight foot masonry wall. That finds the wall waiver to meet the standards of review set forth in section 71022F of the St. Lucie County Land Development Code and is not in conflict with the goals, objectives, and policies of the St. Lucie County Comprehensive Plan. Therefore, staff is recommending the Board of County Commissioners approve this petition subject to the following conditions. Uh, number one, prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall construct an eight foot uh, tall by 10 linear feet in width um, along the northern property line uh, for an extension connecting to the required western masonry wall in order to prevent vehicular light spillage into the adjacent residential properties when vehicles are entering the car wash drive through. Um, this feature shall be included on the site plan and landscape plans prior to the minor site plan approval. Um, and then prior to the second one is prior to the site plan approval, the applicant shall provide an updated landscape plan depicting the required 48 inch hedge, uh, native hedge along the northern perimeter, screening the vehicular use area from the adjacent properties per land development code 70904B. This concludes staff's presentation. Staff and the applicant's representative are available to answer any questions. Does the board have any questions? I, is, does the applicant want to come forward and say anything or do they just want to hold back in case we have any questions? We do have someone coming Mr. up. Mr. Range is coming to the podium. Thank you. Good morning for the record, Bob Range with the Gunster Law Firm here on behalf. Uh, we do believe staff's done an excellent job of presenting this and we're, we are here and I have Mr. Uh, Long, who's a planner with our firm, also here if you do have any questions, but we do believe we meet the criteria and we would appreciate your consideration and a vote of approval for the wall waiver. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the board? I'm open for a motion. Madam Chair, I'll move for approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so uh, Madam Secretary, there was Commissioner Mitchell with Commissioner Bartz as a second. Please call the roll. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Chair Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. This brings us to the announcements. I don't have any. I just want to say thank you again. It's another challenge, but we went through it. Commissioner Zadowski, thank you for your help today and the rest of the board. Um, is there any other comments from the board? If not, um, Mr. Tipton, if you'd like to close us out with announcements. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I too would like to thank IT and uh, communications for their work in today's virtual meeting. Our next meeting will be September 1st at 6 p.m. here in these chambers. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. We'll come to order St. Lucie County Erosion District. <clears throat> First on the agenda is general public comment. Is there anyone from the public who'd like to address the board? Seeing none, we'll move to the approval of the minutes of May 19th, June 2nd, July 7th, and July 28th. Is there a motion? Move approval. Oh, sorry, move approval. Second. There is a motion by Commissioner uh, Bartz, seconded by Commissioner Zadowski. Madam Chair, would you please call, Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Moving to today's consent agenda, is there any item the Commissioner wishes to pull for discussion? Move. If not, I'd just like to offer my thanks to Josh and the staff. This has been a long time coming and it's been needed a long time ago, <laughs> but I'm glad to see that it's finally here. So thank you, Josh, for your hard work and the rest of the staff. Is there a motion to approve motion today's to approve. consent? Motion to approve. Second. It's a motion by Commissioner Townsend, seconded by Commissioner Zanowski. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zanowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Chair Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. There are no uh, regular agenda items. Is there a motion to adjourn? So move. We'll call together the Mosquito Control District meeting for Tuesday, August 18th. Uh, is there any general co public comment? 
Seeing no general public comment, comments closed. I'd like to entertain a, a motion to approve the minutes of the May 19th and the July 28th, uh, 28th 2020 of minutes. Move approval. Second. Uh, we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Zadowski and a second by Commissioner Hutch Hutchinson. Madam Chair, please call the roll. Madam Secretary. Commissioner Townsend. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchinson. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski. Yes, ma'am. And Chair Mitchell. Yes, ma'am. We come to the consent agenda. Does anybody to wish to pull uh, warrants list 4142? Move See, approval, sir. Move a uh, motion to approve sure. by Mr. Uh, Commissioner Second. Zadowski. Second by Commissioner Bartz. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Townsend. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchison. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski. Yes, ma'am. And Chair Mitchell. Yes, ma'am. There are no regular agenda items. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We'll call to order the Environmental Control Board. First item is general public comment. Anyone wishing to address the Environmental Control Board? Seeing the movement, we'll come back to the board. Item is the uh, approval of the minutes for May 19th, 2020. Is there a motion? We have approval. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion and a second. Any comments or questions on the item? All in favor? Oops, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you go back to the roll call, please. Commissioner Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Bartz? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. There are no items on the consent agenda or regular agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Thank you. We are adjourned. That appears to be the... Yeah, Commissioner Bartz, did you have something? Yes, sir. No, I made a motion to adjourn. I was going oh. on to the next meeting. I apologize if I jumped in before I should have. No worries. Okay, we're going to come together as a sustainability district. Um, is there anyone who wishes to address the board? Of course, I can't see the movement. There's uh, no movement, commissioner. Okay. Okay. Um, should I close? public comment, um, approval of the minutes for um, May 19th, 2020. Motion to approve. Motion. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. Can you call the roll, please? Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Townsend? Yes, ma'am. And Chair Bartz? Yes, ma'am go to item four, which is the consent agenda. Um, any, but anyone wishing to pull anything from that item? Madam Chair, move approval. Second. Okay. Any other questions? Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Hutchison? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Townsend? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Zadowski? Yes, ma'am. Chair Bartz. Yes, ma'am. We have nothing on the regular agenda. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Thank you. We are adjourned.